my name is Jan Panchev. Um, uh, I'm currently serving as chairman of European Institute of Liberty, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Bulgarian Libertarian Society, the organization that is co-hosting this, this conference. Um, I want to welcome you today uh, to the third edition of the European Students for Liberty Regional Conference here in Sofia. Um, uh, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a person uh, who likes to, um, to go into long, long speeches and uh, um, take time from the, from, the, from the speakers that we've invited. So I'm just going to switch directly to, to some housekeeping. <clears throat> you probably have seen the agenda for the conference. If you haven't, you can get one uh, at the desk over there. Um, you can see that we have, uh, um, throughout the day, we have conferences, uh, we have talks going on simultaneously in Bulgarian and in English. So uh, the, the, the talks that are going to be in English uh, will happen in this room, Sofia Hall, while the Bulgarian ones will be in Brussels Hall, which is just over the over the corner. Um, we'll have uh, two gentlemen, two bearded gentlemen, uh, who will be our uh, masters of ceremony. Uh, one is uh, Mr. Zayakov. Good morning, everybody. He, he came from Berlin. He came from Berlin to be the master of ceremonies today, so he's really dedicated. The other, the other bearded gentleman is Arkady Sharkov. He's in the back. <laughs> so, they will be our hosts, uh, um, moderators, uh, um, guys with their whips trying to discipline uh, the speakers, the, the, the audience, very libertarian concept, I'm sure that you understand that. Um, so if you, if you see uh, Mr. Zaykov, you'll be uh, in a talk that's going to be in English. If you see uh, Mr. Sharkov, then you'll have to listen to uh, uh, a speech or a discussion in Bulgarian. Uh, you can also see that we have coffee breaks, uh, one at 10 uh, one at half past 11, and one at uh, half past 3. Uh, coffee will be served here in the, this little lobby that's uh, in front of the room. We'll have lunch, uh, which will be served at the restaurant, which is one floor above the lobby. Uh, so we have to go there uh, for lunch. Um, at 5, we'll have a picture break. We go outside, see if the weather allows that. We'll, we'll have a picture with, with all of us. We'll send it to our donors, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, we want to do our conference in Sofia next year. Um, so that's important to know. Also, when we're done with, with the discussions, with the lectures, um, We'll have a social event at the Sticks Bar and Billiards. Uh, it's situated uh, in the under hall next to the National Palace of Culture. Um, if you don't know how to get there, people with red dots on their name tags can help you with that. Uh, also, at the end of the conference, we'll give away vouchers for drinks uh, at Sticks Bar. So if you stick around, you'll get a voucher and you get a free drink um, after the conference. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, we'll try to be on schedule. It doesn't always happen, but uh, I hope that uh, we'll follow the schedule tightly this, this time. And now, uh, before we go into the lectures, bef before I um, uh, give the floor to, to Mr. Zaykov, I want to ask uh, uh, Jan Skapa, who is uh, the event associate for European Students for Liberty, to say just a few words about ESFL. Thank you, Stuan, and welcome also from ESFL. My name is Jan, and I come from the Czech Republic. I'll try to be brief and follow in Stuan's footsteps in introducing the conference. I just want to say a couple of words about what ESFL is. I know you see these banners all over the place, and you're wondering, what is European Students for Liberty, right? So, European Students for Liberty is an international organization that's aiming for a freer future. We're trying to educate, develop, and empower student leaders for liberty all over Europe, but basically all over the world as well, because we have different regions. We have people in Africa, South America, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. Of course, North America, US, we have most of the people. So we're trying to empower people to do st great stuff like these conferences, events on their campuses, uh, start student groups, and just move towards the direction of a freer society in any way they deem uh, possible and useful. So if you are interested in starting a group, doing an event, or just 
want to get some support from European Students for Liberty, please don't hesitate to talk to me. After the, this lecture, in the break, during lunch, during the social, I'll be around, so don't hesitate to ask me how we can help you to get to a fear, freer future. So that's all. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. So welcome everybody, I'm glad to be here today and uh, I want to thank to Mr. Panchi for the invitation but it doesn't matter what I feel or what I think because time is scarce and he said that I have to be very, very precise with time. So let's move on with our first lecture today. Our first speaker uh, is native Bulgarian but uh, he obtained a master degree in environment and resource management from the University of Cottbus, Germany. He also uh, went abroad during his studies in Vienna and Caracas. Nowadays, he is uh, in charge of the Bulgarian office uh, of uh, the consulting company Denkstadt. Please welcome Warnie Bujan Rashev. I hope you're here. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, I have to tell you. Um, it's because of many reasons. Um, I kind of, I went into the libertarian way of thinking within the last two years practically. And, um, and I had many opportunities actually already to interact with many of you. Um, and again, Suyan invited me to speak here. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here, I have to tell you this. Uh, I, I, will, I will tell you something about um, two topics which I consider extremely important. And, um, and I hope it will be interesting. Um, this is a kind of small agenda of what I wanted to tell you. Um, the, the, the initial, the initial um, title of my presentation was Air, Water and Food and so on. Yeah? Um, when I started thinking about it, I found actually that, you know, I can skip the water part. Um, I'll tell you why. So, we'll talk about the, the Volkswagen scandal, but not from the point of view of Volkswagen. We'll talk about air quality and the diesel engine. And we'll talk about food. And um, I'll tell you the story of how European policy led to the problem with air quality and how US federal policy led to the problem with food. So um, whenever I speak of quality of life, the first thing I, I think about is that quality of life is defined by the absence of debt. This is the first, for me, criteria for quality of good life. You know, you have to be living. So um, that's why I ranked here. This, these, are, these are the results coming out of the, um, there is this big study of major risk factors that lead to debt. Uh, done uh, every five years, usually. So the result in 1990 is very interesting. You see that you see that unsafe water source and unsafe sanitation are among the major factors leading to death in the world. But then the result for 2013 is that you know water is practically not there anymore is not among the, the, the top killers in the world. If you, if you make this in the year 19, um, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, if you made this study, um, unsafe water would have been the biggest killer in the world by far. You know, all, this, all, the, all the diseases that are waterborne are actually the diseases that killed most of the people in the world. You know, dysentery, cholera, uh, typhoid fever, yellow fever, malaria is related to water. So 
So it's really, um, we, can, we, can, you know, we can say that the world has solved the water problem, practically. No matter how many times you read in the news that the next war will be about water. It's very far, very far from reality. However, we have two problems that are exacerbated a little bit. And here is the ambient particulate matter pollution. This is pollution of the air, yeah, outside of home. And you see where it is now. Yeah? The death rate per uh, 100,000 people has decreased a little bit. However, on a relative basis, you know, relative to other factors, ambient pollution, air pollution, has increased worldwide as a, as, a, as a factor leading to death. It has not increased, in fact. Um, and then there are two other factors that are going up, high body mass index and high fasting plasma glucose. High fasting plasma, plasma glucose is the is the state of, of your health before diabetes, okay? That is, that is the beginning of, that is a kind of precondition to reach the level of diabetes, okay? And um, so you see how this increased. And there is also one other thing that is actually the top risk worldwide. If you, if you take together all these diet issues, they will be the top risk. So this is the, the really, um, if you go one level upper in the, in the um, risk classification, you end up with diet risks. This means people eat their own food, practically. So, um, I'll tell you something of this, why this happened in Europe. And I'll tell you something of this, why this happened in the States. First of all, to give you a, a kind of a little bit background on Europe. Um, Europe, in the, in the 80s, Europe had a major air pollution problem related to industrial pollution. And uh, if you, if you look here, you see SO2 emissions. SO2 is a sulfur, sulfur dioxide, is a major precursor of particulate matter. So the, the, and particulate matter is what is actually affecting people's health directly. You know, if you, if uh, sulfur dioxide, you know, in order for sulfur dioxide, dioxide to affect your health, it has to be in very high concentrations, which was the case in the past. So, you see what happened in Europe? Within uh, 20 years, the sulfur dioxide problem was, was solved, practically, on industrial level, okay? The same happened with nitrogen oxides from industry. The same happened with lead in fuels. You remember we had this leaded gas wine in the past? It was forbidden in the, in the beginning of the 90s, and then in the year 2000, it was forbidden everywhere in the European Union. So now, <coughs> nobody, nobody uh, puts leaded ga uh, gasoline in tanks in, in, in the European Union. In Serbia, I'm not sure. You are still, uh, it's, it should be still available. <laughs> so, if you, if you look here, you see the major source of SO2 emissions in Europe comes from a small island called Sicily, and it's the Etna volcano. Uh, so in terms of, in terms of you know, human uh, anthropogenic pollution, we are very far away from, from what nature de delivers every year. This is, without, this is without eruptions. This is just you know, every year. Volcanoes tend to um, tend to exhaust some nice emissions. So um, this means Europe Europe must really have solved the air pollution issue. Right? We have decreased pollution by far, really by far. 
Um, if you go to the next graph, this one shows, this one shows, it's not very beautiful. Well, this one shows the air quality, not em until now I, I was speaking about emissions, which is something that is emitted from a source. And now I talk about air quality, which is the quality of air that you breathe. Yeah, this is a very important difference. So, if you look at the air quality map, and this says annual mean PM10 must be under 20 micrograms per cubic meter um, in order to achieve the uh, World Health Organization standards to say that air is safe for breathing. Yeah? If you look at Europe, you see that Europe is, there are some green spots in Europe, but it's, it's mostly yellow or even orange or even red somewhere. You look at the states and you think, ah, you know, Europe was supposed to be greener. And it's not. You know, if you look at LA, New York, and, and San Francisco, and, and Chicago, all these huge cities, they have better air quality than London, Paris, Milan, and all the cities in Europe, which is um, a strange result. And if you look in terms of nitrogen oxides or ozone pollution, then we have even a bigger problem. 95% of Europeans live in, in, in cities with um, ozone pollution, which is above the World Health Organization, um, you know, healthy levels. Uh, and it's, it, this is not the case in the States. It's not the case in, in, in many countries. In Australia, you see Australia. New Zealand. Um, so what is going on? Um, and this is the answer. The answer is on this graph. Um, so you see the diesel car penetration in major world markets here. You see in 1990, Europe, this is the European fleet. This is the percentage of diesel cars. European fleet and Japanese fleet were practically the same. About 10% of our cars were uh, diesel cars. And then something happened. The Japanese went down and reached the American level. You know, uh, in the States, it has always been like 1%. Now it's about 2-3%, not more. Um, and you see here the EU registration of diesel cars. Now, now in 2013-2014, we have 70% of newly registered cars in Europe are diesel cars. And this EU fleet has reached about 50% um, already. 50% of the cars in Europe are, are diesel cars. So what happened meanwhile? Well, there was the Rio conference where the world decided to fight climate change. And because we European um, leaders um, decided that they are the greenest in the world, so Europe Europe made this shift in policy, saying more or less, you know, we have saved the, we have, we have solved the air, the air quality issue in Europe. Um, we can concentrate on the, on the carbon emissions. Yeah? And um, by, by saying this, and, you, and, and looking at the, at, the, at the solutions, you easily find out that uh, a diesel car uses more or less 30% less fuel than, than, uh, than the equivalent uh, gasoline car, which means more or less 25% less carbon emissions per car. Um, and, um, and of course, there, there was another issue as well. So here, here is a, it was a very interesting um, moment when the, when the oil and the, and the car industry together with the European Commission and the European governments made some very interesting decisions. The oil industry had a problem, the European oil industry, because at about this time, Europe stopped producing electricity from oil and heavy, um, heavy fractions of, of, uh, of petrol. Yeah? And, um, and we started using more gas. And the oil industry had a problem. They couldn't fight market. They, there was no market for the heavy fractions. Yeah? So together with the car industry, they came to a very nice decision that the diesel technology is a good solution for them. 
because we use we from 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 one barrel of oil uh, you use resources better it's more resource efficient this was again from Rio you know resource efficiency minimum use of um, of resources and 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 carbon emissions so these two factors were kind of coincided with the with the um, interest of the car and the oil industry to go into the diesel technology and um, and then many things happened yeah? uh, but just I, I'll give you I'll give you a better overview a little bit uh, later uh, you see what happens in Japan here is 97 here comes the, the Toyota Prius um, and uh, you know what is the situation in China 1% of the market is diesel cars, 1% in China. Uh, in Brazil, 5%. In Russia, they never were able to produce a diesel engine, you know, small enough to put it in a, in a car. So um, it was a difficult task for them. Um, but there is one huge problem, and I come back to this slide. Look at India. India is the worst place in terms of air quality in the world. And one of the reasons is that India is the only market outside of Europe that bought the diesel car. 35% of the diesel of the fleet in India are diesel cars. They copied practically Europe. They said Europe is, you know, the greenest, so we copy them. They copied the Euro standards also for cars. So um, here I show you what, what is actually, you don't actually see the gray areas. This is not good. Anyway, so the Euro, the, the, you see the, well, you don't, ah, you see here one, if you are able to, if you have a binocular from there. Um, uh, so this is the difference between the Euro standard and the European Environmental Agency real factors that we, who work in this business, use to calculate the emissions, the real emissions from cars. And you see that the difference in Euro 3 was, you know, 0 0.5 grams per kilometer, and the real factor that was used was 1. And Euro 6, the factor is 0 0.08, this is the limit, and the factor that we use is 0 0.6, so this is about 12 times higher, the factor that we use to calculate real emissions. The factor that the, the European Environmental Agency uses already for 15 years. So if somebody tells you that the, that the Volkswagen scandal is something nobody knew anything about. They are lying. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew that there is a huge difference between the, the limits of the Euro standard and the real emissions. And these are real emissions of cars that are well maintained. I'm not talking here about cars that actually do not have all the, cat uh, you know, the catalytic converters and the filters and stuff, which is the case in, in Bulgaria. Yeah? So authorities, they have always been aware of the problem. Everybody knew about it. And here I give you some of the policies in Europe that actually gave advantage to diesel compared to gasoline cars. Starting with the Euro pollution standards. The Euro 1 from the year 1992 was the same for, for gasoline and for diesel cars. So no matter if your car is gasoline or diesel, you are permitted to emit the same quantities of, of pollution. Starting with Euro 2 in 1996, they made a difference. You know, because the diesel car emits less carbon dioxide, it should be permitted to emit more uh, nitrogen oxides. This was the excuse, so to say. Yeah? And now the difference is huge. Um, if you now the limit here, no, the limit here now for Euro 5, the limit for, uh, for gasoline car is 0 0.06.
for diesel car is 0 0.18, which is three times less, three times more. So uh, diesel cars were permitted to emit three times more, but in fact, they emitted 12 times more. Huh? And everybody knew it. Fuel excise duties. You know that the, the, the price of diesel practically everywhere in Europe has been always lower than the price of, of gasoline. Why? Because the excise duties on diesel have always been lower almost everywhere in Europe. Almost everywhere. Overall carbon target. Well, you know, the, the Commission set uh, the most important target, the most important environmental target for the car industry in Europe was to decrease the carbon emissions of the cars, the average of, of new cars. So if, the, if there is an overall carbon target, of course they are making more diesels in order to achieve the target. Resource efficiency, energy efficiency, taxation based on carbon and efficiency. This is very interesting. Um, taxation on, on cars in Western Europe was based on pollution in the past, in the, in the beginning of the 90s. In, in the late 90s and then after the, the year 2000, it shifted to carbon. So diesel cars emitting less carbon actually paid less taxes. And they are still paying less, uh, less taxes in, in many countries. There were even free parking, and there, there were so many European cities who, you know, made their carbon strategies, climate strategies, whatever you call them, and they, they, and they turned diesel cars green and gave them free parking zones and stuff like this. The, the same that we are doing now with, with electric cars. Biofuel subsidies, you know. Europe, Europe uh, produced uh, five times more biodiesel than bioethanol. So that the subsidies went into the diesel uh, business. EU Green Tech R&D grants. This is very interesting. You know that, you know that the European Investment Bank gave Volkswagen 4.6 billion euro of loans under their climate strategy to decrease carbon emissions. Okay. So we are, we are talking about huge money here. Corporate feed KPIs. I work a lot with corporate clients. All of them have this very important KPI, number one everywhere. My carbon emissions must go down, so we buy diesels. That's it. Yeah? So, so if, if you have so many policies favoring diesel, what do you expect? How the market will, will react? Of course, I have two diesel cars. Yeah? So, this is now, this is a slide that I have shown in, in, uh, in many presentations already for one and a half years. Um, this is a pure coincidence. I chose Volkswagen at this time, <laughs> and I never changed this slide. So it, 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 I, I chose it because this is the, the, the diesel car that sells most in Europe. Yeah? Um, so you see the, the, the comparison. You have the, the same car with a different engine, you see how much more effective the diesel engine is. Yeah? You see the high, the huge difference. And of course, the diesel engine, this was termed the, the green car. Well, if you compare some other things, particulate matter and nitrogen oxide emissions, you find out that the green car is 40, 14 times kind of um, more brown, not really green. Um, and this is, if, this is under the assumption that the car is well maintained. This is again a very important assumption. And under the assumption that there is no software that is changing the stuff inside. So um, you cannot know about it. Um, so what happens in reality is that at the end of the day, yeah. At the end of the day, you have these European climate policies that lead to about 50 million extra diesel cars on the European streets. And if you use all the data, all the, all the um, studies that are done um, on, the, on the death rate coming from air pollution in Europe, you end up with about 5 million additional 
deaths due to dirty air, due to diesel cars on the street. Um, it's simple, you know, 90% of the pollution in the bigger cities of Western Europe comes from the diesel cars. <coughs> so you practically can say that everybody who is ill there because of air pollution um, is, is, is due to the, the, the presence of diesel cars. Um, it's very interesting, of course, these diesel cars, they usually go to neighboring countries or countries like Bulgaria, um, and there they, they finish their life without the filters and the catalytic converters and the stuff that leads to this good result. And the difference then is more than 100 times. You, you see it, you know, everybody has seen it. So, so the result of, of the European policies is, uh, is a problem for us, for people who live in Europe. Okay? And this is the most interesting part. At the end of the day, even CO2 emissions are higher. And this was the main target of the policy. Look at the development. This, these are the CO2 emissions of diesel cars the average, these are the petrol cars in Europe, and these are the cars in Japan. And Japan has no diesel cars, but hybrids, okay? So the, so the policy didn't even achieve its goal, and at the same time it created a side effect that is huge, that is extremely relevant for our er everyday life. Yeah, and now, and now, now there will be, I'm sure, now, now there will be a diesel phase-out policy in Western Europe, and the cars will not be, will not be scrapped. They will come to Sofia, <laughs> and we will enjoy them. Of course, you know, newer diesel cars are better than older ones. That's for sure. But, but when you park in the mall, and somebody, you know, gets into the, gets, uh, you know, below the car and, and, and takes out your filter. Um, and, if the filter and if the filter costs 3,000 lever, you don't buy a new one. That's it. Yeah. So, um, this is my second story. It's about the US. Um, I, <laughs> I, I want to really demonstrate that it's not that, you know, the Americans are uh, very uh, much better than us and uh, Europe is, is um, very socialist and so on. No, no, it's, it's the same story in, in Europe, in the same story in the States on different topics. So the States, they have done similar, ish, similar thing, but uh, with food. And this is, this is the slide that is really, it tells everything. It tells the whole story more or less. Uh, so, but I, I will give you some, um, you know, additional input on this. So, in the 50s, um, many people, or even already in the, in the 40s, but, you know, in the 40s, nobody took care of this because people had some other issues to solve. Um, but in the 50s, many people were dying from heart attacks and coronary diseases and stuff like this. Uh, so, so in, in the States, it was a huge issue and many doctors and scientists invested in, the, in, in trying to find out who, what, what is, you know, killing people. And this guy, Ansel Keys, he was a, a kind of the top scientist at this time in the States and he created the lipid hypothesis. The lipid hypothesis uh, says more or less that saturated fat um, is what is creating the problem. So people should not eat, you know, red meat, uh, cheese, uh, you know, fat milk, uh, eggs, um, and should eat more uh, vegetables, more carbohydrates, and more unsaturated fat, which are the vegetable oils. Um, so this was more or less his, his hypothesis. In 1961, he became a star. He became really a star with this. Um, and, and at the moment he became a star, he was not a scientist anymore. You know, he, he was looking always for evidence 
um, to defend his own hypothesis. And this is not, this is not the, usual, um, the usual way scientists should deal with, with science. You know, scientists must always doubt what, what they are doing, and they should always be kind of able to discuss new hypotheses. No. In the States, this guy created you know, a circle of, of people around himself who completely killed the arrival hypothesis. Yeah? So they even made up evidence. There, there, are, there are books written about it. You know, it's very interesting to, to read about this. Um, they chose only data that supports their own hypothesis. They address the media, they address the government, you know, to, to, to leverage really, to have to have to be stronger with their message. Um, they got all possible grants, you know, be, because they found the, the problem. So they got all the grants from, from the government. Um, and at the end of the day, in 1977, they were able to influence the government so that the government issues dietary guidelines, the first federal dietary guidelines. And in 1984, it was already in the World Health Organization. That's why Time said, you know, the war on fat and cholesterol goes global. So the World Health Organization said in 1984, don't eat saturated fat anymore. Eh? Um, Well, at the end of the day, which is now, they acknowledged that they were wrong. But this led to a real problem, very comparable to the European issue with diesels. Now, you see what happens. This is the 1961, with the availability of added dietary fats in the US. So this is animal fat, lard is from pig, butter, lard, they went down totally. You know, people, were, people started listening on, in, in, uh, and, and they stopped eating this. Huh? And, and, and then margarine you see here, and then vegetable oils. They went up like crazy. Um, So it changed completely the nutrition patterns in the States and, of course, then in the world. Yeah? Because, you know, everybody in the 80s who lived in the 80s, not many people here, um, but everybody who lived in the 80s remembers that margarine was the better choice. Yeah? Um, and we should not eat butter because it's fat and stuff like this. So. Um, it's very interesting to plot this whole story against the obesity levels across age groups in the States. You see the obesity levels in the States. These are the age groups, 18, 29, 30, 44, and so on. It used to be flat, and then it went up like crazy. And of course, um, this was the year, 1977, when the USDA issued their first guidelines saying eat more carb carbohydrates, do not eat saturated fat. People listened. Um, and they had to because, you know, this changed, this changed the recipes in the canteens, uh, in the schools. Uh, this changed the recipes of the companies because there, there, was, there was a huge campaign. There, there is an organization called, very interesting name, I know, just a second. Center for Science in the Public Interest. Uh, this is a huge NGO in the States. They were created in the 70s. And they, were, they had these amazing campaigns against the, the, the food industry, saying that the food industry was poisoning people. Why? Because they were selling red meat, and they were selling butter, and they were selling uh, stuff like this. Everything that we ate for the people who were yesterday in the, in the dinner, everything you ate was wrong. Um, the meat, I mean. So, um, and then the all major fast food uh, companies like McDonald's and all of them, they substituted lard, which is the pig um, um, fat, with trans fat from soybean oil, which is 
um, from the point of view of today, the worst thing you can put in um, where you can put your, your uh, uh, French fries. Yeah? Um, and then, this is probably um, a coincidence. I don't know. Um, but obviously, the obesity, the obesity problem started at this time. Um, it's very interesting to see that um, that when when there is when something turns into uh, official state policy, it's very difficult to change it. Meanwhile, there have been so many studies showing that this is wrong. And the 2010 dietary guidelines, so they they issue them every five years. The 2010 dietary guidelines of the United States Department of Agriculture, they say consume more of certain foods and nutrients such as ta -ta -ta, fat free and low fat dairy products um, so they, they are they are still not able to, to to change their view on this although there is a huge scientific evidence showing that they were wrong now yeah? it's very difficult for for the state or um, for the bureaucracy to stand up and say you know we made a mistake. Let's change it. Very difficult. Um, let me see what is the next slide. Ah, yeah, this is the last one. So I have enough time. I have, I have five minutes. Perfect. I, I come to, to the situation in our favorite country. <laughs> And um, I, I chose some representatives of the state, which are emblematic by some reason. So, so these people, these people, they they sit down, they talk to doctors and scientists in order to decide um, what kind of law you know they have to put to help the people, to help Bulgarian people live better. And um, it's. You, do you know how many doctors in Bulgaria actually study nutrition science in their course when they study for doctors? This is a very interesting question I, I found out um, like two weeks ago during a conference. We had some exchange with doctors and they told us, nobody. It's an optional subject. Nutrition is an optional subject when you study medicine in Bulgaria, and practically nobody chooses it. So when you go to your doctor, they are absolutely unable to tell you what to eat. Yeah? That's very interesting. Um, however, you know, these people, they consult with them, with the same doctors that don't know what is nutrition science, and, and they come to some ideas how to change um, what we eat. Yeah? Um, you saw what happens when the state tries to do this in the American case. The American case actually went worldwide. Eh? It influenced nutrition patterns everywhere. So um, I, I, I take this very personally. And, um, and I definitely believe that there is no way that the state tells me what is proper diet, what is healthy lifestyle, or how to raise my children, what, what should they eat, and stuff like this. Yeah? I, so that's why I always use my, my own example. This is my daughter, finishing the 5K um, competition, 10 years old. It was difficult for her. Um, so I had to be behind her all the time um, to you know, push a little bit. But if, if we want to live a better life, I mean, it's up to us. It cannot be the state that tells us how to do it. Okay? So, um, this is more or less what I wanted to tell you. It's a, it's a, the two stories, maybe I, maybe I exaggerate a little bit, you know, but, but you have to think about it. Because these are the two top cures in the world. It's not a war. We're talking about millions of people who do not eat properly because the state gave them the wrong advice. We're talking about millions of people who, 
who suffer from respiratory disease and all these diseases related to air pollution, because the European Union decided to do something um, without thinking of the side effects of this thing. Yeah? Thank you. for the interesting lecture. We are just on time and maybe there's time for only one question and then we will uh, shorten the break between the lectures. Are there any questions there? Thank you for the speech, Mr. Rashev. Thank you for the speech, Mr. Rashev. I wanted to ask you, how do you define a proper um, comprehensive environmental policy in relation to the uh, externalities that carbon emissions or fuel emissions or pollution um, possess? <laughs> so, externalities are, are very different. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story of of how the externalities are dealt with in a normal country. In the, in the, in the 30s, in, in, in England, these huge coal-fired power plants were the biggest polluter everywhere. Yeah? Um, there was no environmental legislation whatsoever. So there was a guy who lived nearby um, a coal-fired power plant, who went to court and said, this power plant is influencing my health, and he won the case. So the power plant was ordered to install, the f and, and, and this is the situation where the first desulfurization um, uh, installations were made because of this court decision in England. So the power plant was ordered to do something to decrease the emissions. And this is what created the technology that then in the 80s actually decreased so much the, the, the emissions over Europe. So it was a case where the court said, okay, there is an externality on this person. And of course, after this case, all power plants in England had a similar problem because everybody around them said, oh, I want to have the same. You know, the president, a president in their, in their kind of, in their law is something very strong. So, so they were, they were, um, they were made to solve the problem because of a very simple, um, direct, um, direct decision between somebody who is influenced and the power plants. Um, so this is the best way to solve an externality. And this is the way that works in, in many countries. Unfortunately, Europe, um, Europe decided to kind of go into solving the issues um, without having this one-to-one one -one problem. And um, for example, in the States, um, in, in Europe, it was like that. The, the, the European Union and the, and the different governments, they said, okay, we have to decrease SO2 pollution. Yeah? So we have to achieve this level. And they gave it to the power plants. That's it. Yeah? In the States, they did something different. In the States, they, they created a uh, carbon trade, uh, sulfur emissions trading market. So they said that it's like the carbon trading scheme in Europe now. So you, there is, a, there is a ceiling on the, on the total emissions, and, um, and the different power plants were able to, to trade. Yeah? And the American approach decreased emissions much faster and much cheaper than the European approach. Because the European approach was, you have to decrease your emissions this, uh, this much. Yeah? And this is oh, yeah, sorry for the interruption, difficult. but the next lectures have to start yeah. in five minutes. Sure. So thank you very much for uh, your speech, and the break will be very short. So you have time only to switch rooms if you want, or you can stay here.